I'm going to go over some of the key ideas from this book, How Emotions Are Made. And her basic thesis is that there's no universal emotions across all cultures, and there's no universal way that emotions show up in our face. But rather, emotions are constructed based on sort of cultural understanding of our interpretation of what we feel inside. And one of the key concepts that I was very attracted to as an economist is the notion of the body budget, where our body is constantly, um, or, or our brains and our nervous system are constantly predicting um, how much energy we need to expend on any particular thing. And the emotions are really about the relationship between our, the predictions our brain makes about the world around us and about our internal state and um, whether those predictions are expected or unexpected. So I think these, the ideas in this book are really revolutionary and important, especially if you want to understand sort of, um, l like I'm thinking about on this channel, social media. How is social media impacting our emotions, our mental health, our relationships? And I think understanding this framework helps a lot. I'd like to start with the idea of the body budget. And I think this makes so much sense from an evolutionary standpoint that for most of the history of humans and even before humans, organisms have um, limited energy. Oftentimes food is scarce. So they need to use that energy optimally meaning they shouldn't be wasting energy if they're in a safe place where they don't need to be vigilant. And yet they need that energy quickly if uh, a threat comes up or if there's an opportunity for food or an opportunity for mating. So making sure that uh, the brain adjusts the amount of energy available in a person's body is going to be a super useful uh, skill. Uh, from an evolutionary standpoint. As such, she argues that our brains are constantly taking in information about the environment around us, uh, the social environment, the physical environment, in addition to the environment inside of us. Like, are we grouchy? Are we hungry? Um, are we feeling agitated? Are we feeling relaxed? And she argues that the brain and the nervous system are constantly making little predictions about whether or not there's going to be a social threat or a physical threat or a need to be vigilant in our environment and based on our internal environment, how much energy we need to, to be used towards things like that. And that constant prediction that our brain is doing will help us to allocate the hormones and the sensitivity of different nerves and, and such in our bodies. Now, her focus on the book is really on emotion concepts, that when we feel things inside our body, which she, she uses the term interoception for us feeling stuff inside our body. Does our stomach hurt? Do we feel agitated? Do we feel relaxed? That's interoception, us sort of perceiving what's going on inside our bodies. And she makes the argument that concepts that we inherit from our culture will help us interpret what's going on inside of us. And I mean, classic example here is before speech, are you nervous or are you excited? And you could interpret the same sort of agitated feelings before uh, giving a live speech as being really anxious and nervous and worried. Or you could sort of tune into your body and experience the same uh, feelings, but interpret those as excitement. That would be just a different interpretation of the same experience with different emotion concepts. And she highlights the fact that it's the whole context of a person's experience that will determine the, the proper interpretation of the emotion. So she kind of starts the book by debunking the fact that we can have, uh, that we can universally read expressions of emotion on faces. 
And she uses the example of, there, there's a photo of Serena Williams when she just won some tournament or some game, and her face looks like it's scared. Like if you just look at a snapshot of her face in that moment and think about the classic uh, scared, sad, happy faces, most people would just look at that face and classify it as scared. But when you add the context of, oh, she just won that game, suddenly you know, oh, she's not scared, she's elated. The context uh, is absolutely necessary to interpret the emotion she's expressing. Now, she uses this to say that we're wasting our money when we're trying to invest in research for machine technology to read people's faces, to read their emotions from their face. And I was definitely convinced that the face alone is not going to be enough to read people's emotions. But if you get face plus context plus perhaps knowing the person a little bit, it's definitely possible for people to interpret each other's emotions. Now, people get it wrong sometimes. People don't always, uh, people sometimes project their own issues when they're interpreting another person's. Uh, emotion. So nobody's perfect at reading emotions. But people who know each other develop some intuition for emotions. And I'm not willing to say, okay, it's impossible for people to interpret each other's emotions. And I don't think she says that either, but she sometimes doesn't give quite enough credence to the idea that it is still possible for people to read each other's emotions with the full context of the situation, the person, and their facial expressions. So maybe machine learning could actually learn to take into account that whole suite of things as well. So I'm not going to say that um, it's never going to be possible to interpret people's emotions. Maybe not perfectly, but, but I think it's possible, it's at least possible. Now, to think about how the body budget relates to emotions, we might imagine walking down a street where you have previously been mugged. And if that's happened to you in the past, your body budget or your predictive machine inside your brain is going to predict, there's a higher chance I might be mugged, I need to be drawing from my emotional energy ready to do fight or flight if anything happens. And of course, that's going to influence your emotions. You're going to feel more anxiety and fear while walking down that particular street. But if you're walking down a street that's a safe place where you've walked down it a hundred times and you say hi to your neighbors and smell the roses or whatever, then your body budget, the predictive machine inside your brain, can be frugal with your body budget, you can be relaxed, and you'll feel contentment. So connecting this body budget and the, the brain's predictions about how much of your uh, energy and glucose needs to be enacted, needs to be drawn from, that actually does make sense in a lot of situations for how your emotions get shaped. It's about your interpretation of your environment and how much threat might be there, how much uh, contentment might be there. Um, yeah, I think that's a really helpful way of looking at it. But let's go back to this idea of the body budget and connect it to the classic emotions that we think of. Now, of course, she is she's definitely making the case that these are all concepts that Western culture has embedded in us. But we still have an intuition for what they mean, and I think we can still interpret each of these emotions in light of the body budget story. So, so here's a list of emotions I wanted to consider, and I wanted to consider each of these emotions' relationship with the body budget and this predictive machine inside our head. And I classified a few of these as anticipatory emotions. These are emotions where the predictive machine inside your head is looking at the situation and looking at what's going on inside of you and um, making a prediction that you need to perhaps up your budget of energy uh, to be applied to this situation. So like fear is basically something where uh, your, your interpretation of your situation says, you might need to exert a lot of energy in this situation because there could be something bad coming. And so that's going to up your use of energy in your body, glucose and everything you need. 
And that's combined with the negative emotion as you think about the possibility of whatever's going to happen next. So yeah, that, that does make sense in relation to the body budget concept. Same with anxiety. With anxiety, it's almost like there's this uncertain, vague fear, and maybe you don't need full out uh, all of your glucose, all of your energy ready to be used in a fight or flight mode, but maybe it needs to be a little bit engaged just in case something bad is about to happen. Contentment is the opposite. Contentment is where your uh, body budget is predicting you don't need to be in fight or flight mode based on the environment. So uh, you can relax, your body budget doesn't need to ramp up your energy, and that's contentment. Happiness is a vague concept. Happiness, uh, there's so many complexities with happiness, so I'm gonna let that one uh, be. I'm not gonna comment on that one. Disgust is pretty similar to fear. Disgust is sort of preparing you to get away from the thing that's disgusting. So um, yeah, that, that relates to this anticipatory body budget predictive machine. And then I categorized the emotions anger, surprise, and joy as emotions where there's, there's a difference between what your predictive brain predicts and reality. Like there's an unexpected change in your need to uh, use your body budget more or less. So with anger, oftentimes um, there's something that you think you're owed. You felt like the environment or something around you owed you something and you find out you're not getting that from your environment and therefore you may need to put forth a lot more body energy to actually get what you want or what you'd hoped for. So that difference between expectation and the amount of energy your body needs to exert, that creates this emotion anger. Or at least this is, this is me trying to interpret things through this body budget lens. Surprise obviously is something where you didn't expect it, your body budget was going along, relaxed, content, and suddenly something happens that requires a huge rush of body budget energy immediately. And that can be positive or that can be negative, but uh, that body budget, that body budget and the predictive machine are not in line and have to suddenly get into line. So yeah, that, that makes sense in this body budget context. And I feel like joy is a little bit like that too. It's a, joy has a bit of a surprise element where it's, it's not just contentment, it's not just the relaxed, I don't need to exert body budget energy, it's more like I get to exert energy because this is a situation that's fun to exert energy in. So when I thought about all of these emotions, it really did make sense that it related the body budget and the predictive machine in your brain to adjustments the body needed to make. Now she has a ton of tips in the book for uh, how to improve your emotional life and I won't go into all of them. Um, one of them she mentions is to improve your emotion vocabulary. Like the more concepts you have for understanding what emotion is going on inside of you, the better you'll be able to manage. And I think that's absolutely true. Because the concepts are meant to be tools. They're meant to be useful for helping you navigate your situation, for helping you uh, navigate your energy that you have available. And if you can better match the tool to the situation, the most useful concept for understanding my emotion or their emotion, uh, just the better you'll be able to manage the emotional environment and the social environment. Now, one critique I have of the book is that the first half was, was brilliant, the first half was uh, really well explained. The second half where she tries to apply this to physical health, to the legal situation, she tries to sort of apply this knowledge to different situations. And she doesn't always fully explain the connection. Um, in some books I've read, <laughs> There's the fallacy that the person has a brilliant theory on how the wo world works, and then in the last half of the book when they apply it, they're just giving their political opinions. And I'm sure their political opinions are informed by the theory they came up with, by the theories they're presenting in the books, but they're not 
that well connected and if we're being honest their political beliefs are probably more influenced by their social circles and their news consumption than the theories they came up with. And I, I have a bit of that critique here that she, uh, there are some things that she just says really casually that I thought needed a lot more explanation for how she's connecting the ideas in the beginning of the book about emotions with those situations. Like at one point she, she says we need to rethink trial by jury. Another point um, she, you know, she criticizes free speech. And, and she has other views like that that are just mentioned in such a small portion of the book where there's such big issues. And in some cases, I could actually imagine someone making the argument on both sides of that topic using her theories about emotions. So I wish she would have um, explained more the way she sees the ideas about body budget and emotional concepts connecting with her, her views in the last half of the book. It wasn't always fully spelled out. But overall, it was a really incredible book. I highly recommend it. I think it's important to understand this book if we want to understand why is social media influencing the way we feel so much.